Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching Guerrilla Christianity on YouTube. Uh, this channel is completely self-funded, and we never ask for donations. We don't do sponsorships. There's one thing that you can do to help us get more viewers, though, and that is to like, comment, and share. And also subscribe to our channel so that you can know when more new content comes up. We put up new content all the time. I want to thank you again for watching. Be blessed. And I want to invite you to take out your Bibles, either the ones that you brought with you or the ones in the pews, and turn in them with me to the book of 1 John, the first general epistle of John the Apostle. We're beginning a, uh, if you're following along in the Pew Bible, by the way, it's found on page 240 of the New Testament. Uh, we are beginning a new series based in the first epistle of John the Apostle. And this series is called Agape, the love of God. Agape. We have heard about this word, agape, and for the next several weeks leading up to Pentecost, we will be looking in depth at what agape is, how we can experience it, and how we can express it toward one another, toward the world, and toward God. Let's hear the word of the Lord for us now. The first epistle of John, beginning at chapter 1, verse 1, and all the way through to chapter 2, verse 2. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. <clears throat> Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Again, the focus of our Easter series will be agape. Agape. There are four words in the Greek that describe love. Okay? And... In the English, we have one word, which is love. But the way we love one thing or the way we love one person may not be the same as the way we love another. And so the Greeks have four different words which describe how we can love. The first is storge. Storge is the kind of love that you have within a family. It's familial love. Siblings. Fathers, mothers, children, <coughs> grandparents, basically all of those who are in your family, that is storge, love. Then we have philia. Philia we're pretty well fam familiar with because we sit in the shadow of a city called Philadelphia, which literally means the city of brotherly love. Philadelphia or philia is the love that friends have 
for one another that is binding like, uh, like familial love, okay? So best friends would have this philia. And we in the church are called to have philia with one another as well. And then there is eros. Eros is, well, it comes from the Greek god of love, eros. The Romans called him Cupid. He was the son of Aphrodite. And the word eros is exactly what it sounds like. It's the love between a man and a woman. It's an earthly base love that is uh, mostly, it's a feelings of passion, okay? That's what eros is. But the fourth type of love is one that we see almost exclusively in the Bible. Very rarely do we see this fourth type of love written about in any Greek literature or any Greek writings. And that fourth type is agape. But it is all throughout the New Testament. <coughs> the word agape is all throughout the New Testament. And it's also the word that was used uh, by the translators of the Septuagint to describe God's chesed, his steadfast love, his mercy, okay? Um, and so that is agape. Uh, agape is probably best defined <coughs> in 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 4 through 8. And what we read there is that love, agape, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And that's agape love. Agape. Jesus uh, told his disciples that the greatest commandment was to love, agape, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. To love God with complete abandon, that is our first commandment, and it covers the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments. Then he said the second was like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. Agape, again, loving, sacrificially. If you read this list in 1 Corinthians, you find that love that is described there, the agape love is, it's giving, it's sacrificial, it expects nothing in return. It, it is not selfish at all. It's selfless. And so, he says, love God, love your neighbor. In the Sermon on the Mount, he, he said, you have heard that it was said that you should love your neighbor and hate your enemies. But I tell you to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you so that you may be perfect as your father is perfect. What does he mean by that? How is God's Agape love perfected, well, the whole of humanity has been rebelling against God from the very beginning, and yet he sent his son to die for our sins. That's incredible. That is sacrificial. That is giving with no heed of any return. What can we return to God that could possibly compare to that? He gave everything. Finally, he told his disciples to love one another. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. He's talking to his disciples now. The fellowship that was there, followers of Jesus, love one another as I have loved you. So should you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the mark of a Christian, is loving one another. Agape love, sacrificial love, giving, expecting nothing in return. Okay? It's a love that is not, it's not a give and take. 
It's a give and give more, okay? It's expecting nothing in return and not doing anything for a reward, but just because of the love that you have for someone. That is agape love. So love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Love one another sacrificially as Christ loved us. Laying down his life for his friends. Jesus said, this commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. That you lay down your life for your friends. That's agape love. And we find agape all throughout the pages of John's gospel and also this uh, letter, this epistle that is before us today. Now, the first epistle of John is going to be our text for the great 50 days of Easter. So let's take a real quick introduction to this letter. What is it? Who wrote it? What was, when was it written? Why did he write it? Well, first of all, first the, the author is John, the apostle, and it's not contested uh, by any ancient authorities. Nobody uh, attributed this letter to anyone but the apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And there's a couple of reasons why I think that it's valid to believe that John wrote this letter. Even though <clears throat> nowhere in this letter does he say, I, John, write these things to you. Right? He, never, he never names himself. It's, it's funny because uh, in his gospel, he doesn't name himself either. In his own gospel, John never says, I, John. He, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, that is not, an, uh, that is not a, a title of distinction or, or an, an arrogant saying that he has used. But instead, what he's saying is, my identity is shall be forever that Jesus loved me. Not that he loved me more than everyone else, but that my identity is in that Jesus loved me. That's how he described himself in his own gospel as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in this, God, in this letter, he doesn't even name himself at all. In fact, he doesn't have a salutation uh, this epistle, unlike other epistles, has no salutation, it has no address, it has no closing remarks. Remarks. It's more like a didactic, okay? In other words, it's a, it's a teaching document. He says, there's something that I need to address with you, and this is what it is, and he starts right into it, you know? Uh, and so, that brings me to why. Why was this letter written? Well, it was written to address the twin heresies of docetism and Gnosticism. Now, those two go pretty much hand in hand, but they're, very, they're also very different in certain ways. But docetism comes from the Greek word daka, which means to appear or to seem. And so the belief of the docetists were, was that Jesus only appeared to be human. He was only God. He was not in the flesh. The Docetists and the, the Gnostics, I keep saying Gnostics because it has a G at the beginning. Just picture the G when I say Gnostics, okay? Or I'll just say Gnostic because I've been saying it all morning. Um, <clears throat> the, the Docetists and the Gnostics both believed that all of the material universe is only corrupt and evil. There is nothing in the material world that can be good. And only the spiritual realm is perfectly good. And so there is no mixing of the two. And God is spirit. And Jesus, if he is God, cannot be material. He cannot be flesh. That was what they were denying in the first century. And that is what John was addressing specifically in his uh, gospel. So the docetists believe that that Jesus didn't actually die on the cross because you can't kill God. He only appeared to die. He only seemed to die. And that's where we get the word daca, docetus. He seemed like he died, but he didn't actually die. Okay? 
The, the Gnostics, on the other hand, the word gnosis means knowledge, and so they believed that they had a secret knowledge that would help them to elevate themselves to salvation and to earn that salvation, which is absolutely against what the Bible teaches. So John was writing this letter early. We're still talking about the first century. We're still talking about within 50 years of the death of Christ. Okay, these heresies had already arisen and already the church was working to to uh, to address them and correct them. All right. In fact, the the reason we have the creeds or confessions of faith, most of the time they were devised because they were addressing a specific heresy that had arisen and the church was saying, nope. That's not what we believe. We believe in this. And that's where you get like the Apostles' Creed. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because there was a man named Marcion who said that the God of the Old Testament was a wicked God named Yahweh. He was a materialistic God. He was a Gnostic. And that materialistic God created all things, and the whole universe is just wicked to the core, and there's nothing good in it. But the God of the New Testament is, a, is the Father of Jesus Christ. It's a different God. Yahweh and God the Father are two different gods. That's heresy. So what the people said, or what the church said was, we believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. He is the creator. The God the Father of Jesus Christ is the creator that we see in Genesis. And so that's what, Jesus, that's what John's doing here. He's trying to address these heresies and to assure the believers that they are on the right path. When did he write this? Well, it's estimated he wrote it in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, that would be the 0080s and the 0090s, not the 1980s and the 1990s. Um, but it was written in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was written after his gospel. And we say that because there's a lot of things that are in the gospel that he refers to in this letter as if it was information that he had already presented. So in other words, he had already written down his gospel. He had given the gospel to the people. And now this letter is saying, hey, remember what I wrote in the gospel? That's what we're talking about here. And so that's how we know when this was written, who wrote it. Um, What's the primary message? The primary message of the epistle of John. If you boil it down to two statements, it's this. Number one, God is light. And number two, God is love. And we're talking about agape love. Okay? Those are the two uh, primary messages. And both of them are introduced in his letter in the same way. If you look at verse 5, he says, This then is the message. This then is the message. And that's what he says uh, again in verse in chapter three and verse 11. He says, for this is the message. So that's what he's doing. He's introducing the message. Verse five says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Chapter three, verse 11 says, for this is the message that ye heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Again, so the two basic themes of John's epistle are light and love. So let's dive into this text. Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of light, uh, the word of life. Now I want you to think for a minute about this, that which was from the beginning. And then look at the way that John begins his gospel. Uh, John chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Notice there is a continuity. He's talking about the beginning. And what he's doing is he's tying the work and life of Jesus Christ to the work of God in creation, okay? Because the Greek word that he uses is arche. It's the same word in both the gospel and in this epistle. 
And it's the same word that the translators used for the Greek in the beginning in Genesis 1.1 that says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So he's linking both his letter and his gospel to the creation account. And what he's saying is where God created all things and then we had the fall. But here is God coming into the world again in the flesh and he is restoring all things. Now, if this is a recreation that Jesus is uh, that Jesus in the world is a creation event and he's restoring all things. Now he says, he uses four verbs, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked upon and our hands have handled, what we have touched, what we've seen, what we've heard, what we looked upon, what we have touched. Okay, all of these things are asserting that this is a first-hand eyewitness account. This is that's what's telling us that John is the God, is the writer of this letter, is because he walked with Christ. Okay, he also used this same language in his gospel when he said the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So verse 2, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life, verse 2, for the life was manifested and we have seen it and bear witness and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. The thing that was, the, that was manifested to us we now manifest to you, okay? So the life, in verse 2, the life was manifested. The life is the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. And the word manifest speaks to how abundantly clear this information was presented firsthand. Again, in John's gospel, he writes, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. So we're talking about that eternal life. In fact, he says that eternal life, specifically the eternal life in Christ. Christ doesn't have a beginning. He's not created. He is eternally begotten of the Father. Again, we see this in the Nicene Creed now. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made consubstantial or of the same substance with the Father, through him all things were made. A lot of the language that they got in the Council of Nicaea came directly from John's writings. You see a lot of that in there. So, verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now let me paraphrase the sentence for you. This is what John is saying. He's saying, our eyewitness compels us to tell others and to bring them into fellowship with us and with God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, his Son. He's saying, I want you to be fellows with me. I want you to be in fellowship with me. Now that word fellowship is a Greek word, koinonia. And it's very, we're going to see this a lot in this writing. Koinonia. Uh, that same word, um, if, if today were another Sunday, when we read <coughs> the, the entire lectionary, we would have read <coughs> today Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through 35, which says this, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul, Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. That word common, by the way, is the Greek word koina, which is the root of the word koinonia. They had all things in common. They were in fellowship together. And neither was there any... Uh, um, uh, with great power that gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked 
For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and bought the pl- and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So we would have read that today had we been reading the entire lectionary. Um, And it's linked to this letter because it's that same idea of koinonia or fellowship. Okay? Verse 4 says, These things we write unto you that your joy may be full. Now, some English translations say your joy. Some say our joy. Which is it? I don't know. (laughs) But they both mean the same thing, okay? I, I know it sounds funny. Now, in the English, your and our is very similar, isn't it? If you drop the Y, you get our, okay, from your, right? It's very similar in the Greek. In the Greek, um, human means of you or yours, and hemon means of us or ours, right? So it's probably just a copyist error, but what's, what's, what's John really trying to say here? Either way, doesn't matter. Your joy is complete. Our joy is complete. Either way, the point is that John's joy and the joy of his readers are inextricably linked by the message and the fellowship that John hopes to achieve with them. Okay, so that's the beginning of this letter. Again, notice there's no salutation. He doesn't say, dear church in Ephesus, because that's who he's writing to. He's writing to a church in the church in Ephesus. And this is a circular letter, so it's supposed to be distributed to all the churches, and they're supposed to read it in all the churches so that they all hear the same message, right? Um, but he doesn't do that. He doesn't say, dear church in Ephesus, this is, this is John speaking to you. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for asking. No, he just jumps right into the message, So uh, that's why I call this a didactic um, letter instead of a a letter. Well, it's a teaching letter. All the letters are for instruction. But now, verse 5 is the beginning of the message. He says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. The message that God is light, again, links... To Genesis chapter 1, where it says that the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. So the fact that God is light and there in him there is no darkness at all all leads us into the next message and it also establishes the work of Jesus Christ as a recreation event now verses 6 and 7 he starts to use <clears throat> some he, he he takes these contrasts okay he contrasts one thing against another and so verses 6 and 7 are two contrasts if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. So here's the contrast. The contrast is, if we say that we have fellowship with God, I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm walking in darkness, I'm a liar, okay? Okay. So the, the, it's contrasting the people who walk in darkness and the people who walk in the light. The former are liars if they say they have fellowship with God because God is light, not darkness. The second group, if they're walking in the light, they have fellowship not only with God, but with each other. There's that koinonia again, okay? They're covered by the blood of Jesus. Note that Jesus' blood cleanses us from all sin. It's not mere forgiveness, but it's also deliverance from slavery to sin. Again, Acts uh, chapter 4 and verse 32. I draw your attention to that last word. They had all things in common, and common is the Greek word koina, which from which we get koinonia. 
They had all things in common. They had fellowship with one another. Now, verse 8. Verse 8. Um, the second pair of contrasts, verses 8 and 9, are those who say they have no sin and those who confess their sins. Let's read it. <clears throat> verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse, there's that word again, cleanse, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, <clears throat> those who say that they have no sin, again, they lie. They don't just lie to God, they lie to themselves. I'm good, I'm a good person, I don't need anything, there's nothing that I need to repent of, I'm fine. But that makes God a liar, okay? Okay. Admission of guilt is a prerequisite to forgiveness, and it's an integral part of repentance. Repentance, again, remember, if I'm, if I'm going in the wrong direction, if I'm walking away from God, repentance involves three things. Number one, I say I'm walking in the wrong direction. I admit that this is sin that I am walking in. That's confession, okay? The the, uh, the Greek word is homologomen, homologomen, which is homa, same, and logos, word, same word, which means we are agreeing with God that we are sinners, okay? The same word. Um, so I say I'm in sin, then repentance means I turn around, I go, now I'm in the right direction, and I stay in that direction for as long as I live, as, as much as best of my ability. Whenever I stray from the path, God's Holy Spirit will be there to correct me and bring me back onto the path. So that is um, when we confess our sins. That is what repentance is. Um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, the purpose of our salvation is not simply to forgive, but also to deliver us from our sins so that we can walk in fellowship with him and each other. Sin is slavery. Sin is slavery because we, we, we tell ourselves, uh, you know, I, how many times have you heard somebody say, oh, I could stop anytime I want, you know? Well, that's, that's a lie. You, you need to stop and stop and just be stopped and be done you know it's not easy but that's what it requires and so but this is what he's saying notice he says if we say that we have not sinned we make him a liar and his word is not in us so not only does our denial of sin make us deceive ourselves but we are also calling god a liar because in his word, it says explicitly, Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. And then in verse 23, it says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Every one of us. There's not one person on the face of the earth who has never sinned, save one, and that's Jesus Christ himself. Okay. So that's the end of chapter one. We went through that. And then we have two short little verses here for chapter two. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, my little children, when he uses that phrase, he's, he's not talking to like a Sunday school class, okay? He's speaking to adults, but he's He's an elder in the church, and this is like a, a term of endearment for those that he cares about. My little children, he says, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. Now, that's not an endorsement for the doctrine of Christian perfection, okay? Even after we're saved, we're still in the flesh. We're still subject to temptation. But the difference is that if... <clears throat> anyone sins, we have an advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, the word there for advocate is parakletos, 
which is only used here and in the Gospel of John. It's the only two places where that word parakletos or paraclete appears. In the Gospel of John, it appears in chapter 14, when, John's, or when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, another advocate, another parakletos, to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So he uses that word parakletos. It's a legal term. It's an advocate. It's one who stands alongside of you in a court of law. Okay, when you when you go and you're facing the judge, you don't want to go face the judge alone. You want to have an advocate or a lawyer, right? Jesus is our advocate and he stands at the side of God and he uh, intercedes for us. And then he says, uh, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation, it's a big churchy word, right? Um, what it really means is that it is the, Jesus is the satisfaction of the father's wrath. In other words, Jesus bore our punishment for us. Again, back to Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. But the good news is <clears throat> that we are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood, <clears throat> to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. So he's the propitiation of the Father's wrath. And it says, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, that's not to say that when Jesus died on the cross, he he made it universally well he made it universally possible let's put it this way to be saved but he didn't universally save all people there is a requirement and that requirement is repentance and faith repentance and faith okay so jesus's sacrifice was sufficient for all because jesus is as god he is eternal and infinite and so he had the infinite capacity to pay the price for all sins, for all time. Forward and backward, okay? People always ask, well, how do people get saved who, came, who lived and died before Jesus? His sacrifice on the cross was sufficient for them as well. Now, they didn't maybe say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but what they said was, I trust in Jesus. God alone for my salvation. Only by God and his grace can I be saved. And that's true through Christ before and after the cross. Okay. The whole world, Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient for all, but only effectual for those who believe. The, um, the early reformers would say, sufficienter pro omnibus, sufficient for all, Efficacitor pro electus, effective only for the elect. Don't get all tweaked about that word elect. It just means those who believe. Okay. So the purpose of John's epistle is to inform his readers of their salvation in Jesus Christ, that we now walk in the light and not in darkness, that we are forgiven and delivered from our sin, that even if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father who is the atoning sacrifice for our sin. When we have fellowship with God and with one another in Jesus Christ, our entire life is one that is defined by the light of God in us. We repented of our sin. We turned away from the darkness. And now we walk together in the light of God by faith. And in our fellowship, we help one another not to stumble by the Spirit of Christ in us. Now, it's providential that this message comes on a Sunday when we gather for communion. Because the word communion comes from the Latin word communio, 
which is the Latin rendition of the word koinonia. It means fellowship. It's a common sharing of things as described in the fourth chapter of Acts. It is the word that translates the Greek word koinonia that we've been seeing throughout the reading today. And so I invite you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to enjoin this fellowship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and with us all, who are fellow believers in Christ and fellow travelers in this life of light. Embrace one another by the agape love of the Father. Come to the table of Christ and remember the Lord's death until He comes. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this faithful witness of John the Apostle whose love for his fellow believers led him to write these instructions down for us today. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that opens our eyes and helps us to see and receive the truth of your Holy Word. We thank you for this church family that stands with us in our struggle with sin and temptation and which helps us to walk in your glorious light. Above all, We thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who bore the punishment for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the whole world. We pray for those outside these walls, that they may come to know the loving sacrifice and forgiveness found in our fellowship with each other and with Jesus Christ. We pray for the salvation of the lost, that you would be glorified, and that our joy may be complete. All this we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Hi, I'm Pastor Brett, and I want to thank you for watching this video. Now, this channel is completely self-funded. There are no uh, sponsors, and I never ask for donations. So if you'd like to help uh, to get this content in front of more people, what you can do is to like, subscribe, and comment on the video. And also, if you think that there's someone else who might want to see this, go ahead and share it with them as well. I want to thank you for watching, and be blessed.